Okay. Are we on time? Okay. Oh, I hate that when they do that. Um, everyone can hear me, that sort of thing. You know, you know where the emergency exits are and no smoking. You know. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I am going to talk for about 45 minutes about something called SmartDB. And the, the very quick sentence of it is that uh, you should do your stuff in the database bring code to the database, and somebody told me, that's like data gravity. I thought that was a good expression. This knowledge, mind that logo up there. This presentation was also done approximately in uh, on a PG day. So this knowledge is transferable to Postgres, MariaDB, MySQL, uh, Transact SQL, all those things. That was the first point I wanted to make. I'm going to talk about SmartDB, bring code to data. If you can develop your software with a focus, a center on the database, you have a much better chance of writing successful applications and systems. That's my opinion. We can discuss that afterwards over coffee. I will also have a small quiz in the middle. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm Oracle Ace. I'm a black Ace. Oracle don't pay me to be here. Um, 25 years of Oracle. And uh, this is how I blow off steam. I, I ride a motorcycle. If you want to discuss motorcycles afterwards over coffee, yep, can. Uh, my logo cloud, I like this. These are my customers in the last uh, 15, 20 years or so. If your company has a nice, colorful logo, if you would like your logo up there, your boss needs to give me a call. Or you have to give me a call. Um, this is what I do. I have worked in Singapore. I have walked around like this for exactly one day. And believe me, that's warm. Most of my life, I sit at the desk and I drink coffee. And I do phone conferences. So a lot of my work is actually quite boring. Um, there you go. The agenda. The next couple of 45 minutes, we will be, I'll give you a little bit of history, you know, bitter old gray man, that sort of thing. Um, I'll tell you that you should bring your code to the data. It's a bit like Hadoop, you know, bring code to data, don't bring data to code, don't drag your data around, do your stuff in the database. If you think I've heard that before, then yes, you got the message, you could leave the room, but you'll miss a lot of the fun. Um, they now call it smart DB. They used to be call it thick DB, and it is really an old concept. It's just using procedural languages in the database. Um, I'll show you a few cases, and at the end of the fourth case, there is a quiz for those who fell asleep. You know, wake up your neighbor, answer the question. Uh, I have a couple of quotes from a movie, and from Einstein, and from Goethe for the Germans. Uh, smart quotes. And uh, with a bit of luck, I, I just learned that there are five minutes for questioning afterwards, and there is always the coffee break and the dinner afterwards anyway. So, Welcome. Thick DB. Keep this image in mind, and there is a better image afterwards. Um, so if you build an IT system, you will probably store some kind of data. Um, you will probably have a database somewhere in your system, whether it's a document store, a key value, something, a Hadoop, something trendy, uh, or just a plain old-fashioned relational database. Um, my message, and if you just remember this, my message is you should use that database. And a database does not look like that. That's not the database. Okay? Okay. <laughs> So if you do any work with data, if you do that work in the database, at the end of this presentation, you will understand that the best place to process your stuff is in the database, in most cases. There are exceptions, and we will visit a few of those. Um, and I, do, I did like this one. Somebody gave me the, the keyword data gravity. I think data gravity applies to code as well. Code should go to the database. Let me try and explain. Now forget this image. But what you should remember is, this is your database. It is elegant, it is powerful. That's what your database is. If you want to remember anything from this talk, just imagine this is your database. Okay? No jokes about witty stuff and all that. That's it. 
Um, so my, my job in one of my customers, I'm part of what they call the enterprise response team. We get to clean up the shit of the architect. I mean, we get to, yeah, to clean up the mess. Okay. And there are three particular problem cases that we think we have. One is how do you find the problem? Is it in the database? Is it in some component? Is it in the browser, the front end? Citrix, anyone still using Citrix? Okay, cursed whoever they invented that, you know, Citrix stuff. They, they promise everything will run in Citrix. And when an application is deployed in Citrix, we know for a fact that it's probably not working well. Um, and then they say, oh, it's probably the network. We might have latency problems. We might have not enough bandwidth. But we don't really know. You have to dig in, find log files, measure stuff, sniff networks, all of that. You have to chase the problem to find it. Now, guess what? If everything was in the database or on the database server, I would at least know where to look for my problem. Make sense? So this is my first category of problems. I don't know where my problem is, except I've got screaming users. Second type of problem is a chatty protocol. Slurping data from the database, pushing data to the database. This is easy. You know, when you see too many calls going up and down, you have a chatty protocol, and the answer is you need to do less calls, or you have to move your application stack closer to the database. Second type of problem. This is actually probably the most frequent problem we have at this point in time, but the customer is old-fashioned. Modern systems shouldn't have this problem anymore. Uh, the third type of problem is nobody knows how to maintain the old code anymore. We've got Visual Basic from like 2000. There are actually still um, copies of Forms 3 out there, migrated to Forms 4.5, to Forms 5, Forms 6, Forms 10, and it's code with screen triggers. Nobody knows how that system works anymore. This is another problem. Code tends to be something of a fashion, you know, Ruby on Rails. Who's using Ruby on Rails? See, it's out of fashion. It, it was the hype in about 2009. Okay? And, and there is actually some COBOL still around. So these three problems, and you can avoid and fix those three problems if you do more work in your database. Is the message getting home already? Okay. Um, there are some additional reasons why you should do stuff in your database. Bryn will probably tell you it's more secure. Um, you can have well-defined APIs, you can use whitelisting, you can limit your exposed surface, you can also scrutinize incoming parameters. The security guys like that concept. I'm not so sure if security is my main selling point, but it's an argument. Does it make sense? Any, any uh, white or black hat hackers in the, in the room? What do you think? We need to discuss this. I'm, I'm not so sure if database-centric is actually more secure, because I know how to hack an Oracle database. So, in my opinion, doing everything in the database is not that secure. Um, you have all sorts of layers of an application. You've got the user interface, the user-friendly interface. It's not an obvious thing to put in a database, but it helps. You've got your business logic. A lot of people will say, oh, we do that in Java, Apache, Node.js, what have you. And you've got your persistence layer. That belongs in a database. There is no discussion about that. You know, persistence is a database thing. At the end of this talk, you might be convinced that business logic and even some of the user interface could be done by the database. And there are, de there are definite advantages to that. So this whole layer thing can go in the database. And don't be fooled. You can do that with MySQL, with MariaDB. You can do that with Aurora. Postgres is an excellent choice as well. You know, the logo there is actually, uh, Timor knows, it's the PG Day Russia. So, but the PG Day part fell off. I guess we're Oracle sponsored here. Um, the, the last argument is you want, you want to be able to do live maintenance on your code. You want to be able to upgrade your application on the fly without downtime. That problem is solved. Bryn Llewellyn can tell you about EBR. It works. I find it dauntingly complex, but it can work. You need a clever guy to work it. Um, but you can have multiple versions of APIs, multiple versions of calls, if you like. Uh, any of those databases can use a construction of synonyms and views to mask old and new versions. 
It requires thinking, it requires work, but it can be done. You know, you can maintain a system while your database is up. Any questions on that? I'm talking into a black space, so... Um, this is the old man in the, in the armchair. I'm going to give you four cases. Uh, I had a recent discussion with a .NET guy. And you might be in the room, by the way. Not sure if... Yeah, okay. um, I had a system a number of years ago where the customer wanted to do 1,800 transactions, messages per second. It, it got fixed, but it was a difficult one. Um, I had a system with ad hoc generated SQL, so the application would generate a query and that would run. And this is a possible recipe for disaster. Um, and then we, we had a, a CPU heavy system. This is my favorite problem system. And I've got like seven slides about it. And they tried to kill that with hardware, kill it with iron, Kiwi. Nowadays, Kiwi is no longer kill it, kill it with iron. It means kill it with instances, buy more Amazon instances. And it doesn't always help. Uh, oh, is that it? Mm, yeah, that's it. Um, so the first case, the .NET guy, he was slurping data. That's why the slurp thing is here. Uh, you want to process a fairly large set of data in your application. So he had to fetch the data over into an array. He's like <laughs> fetching it. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then you have to loop through the processing and you have to push it back to the database again. It's like, <laughs> and then <laughs> think about it. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> get it. So here's me saying, so what about, why, why did you not consider Transact SQL? TSQL for Microsoft. You know, you have to have a, and he goes, oh, dynamic SQL and the arguments and all that. So he was asking me questions and I thought, hey, you know your way around this system. You're asking the right questions. Um, avoid dynamic SQL, avoid SQL injection. And then about 10 minutes later, he came out and said, you know, we did a, a proof of concept and we decided that we would do this with Transact SQL for performance reason. You know, that, that's the best case. You know, we shouldn't, we didn't need to have that discussion. But he, he wasn't quite happy. I don't know if the bottom of the screen is readable. He wasn't quite happy because I, I'm becoming a DBA. Is that a bad thing? How many of you here are ex DBAs? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. See, if, if I only talk to DBAs, it's useless. DBAs know this stuff. You need to talk, tell this to developers. Uh, so that was the, the case of the .NET guy who was convinced by his own proof of concept. Uh, T SQL, by the way. So there's your problem and there's your solution. Um, the next anecdote was a, a customer, American company. They had a fairly simple system, but they had queuing problems and they had a lot of layers in Java. And they needed to process 1,800 transactions per second. And I was like, nah, that's heavy. But they had nine types of messages. A message, in their words, was, was something that came in as an XML and it had to be processed. It was fairly easy. You could compare it to your pay-as-you-go phone. You have to query. Sometimes you query for data. Sometimes you do an update. Most of the cases, you do a log. You, you record what you've done. Fairly simple. So I was like, yeah, that's probably doable. What kind of hardware? Ha, 32 CPUs. Okay, 32 CPUs, 10 milliseconds for a transaction. That means with 1,800 transactions per second, I will be loading my machine for what percentage? About 60% machine load. 10 milliseconds for a transaction, 1,800 in a second. You will fill that machine for about 60%, probably more, but yeah. But it's doable. And the customer said, well, we got to 17. I said, well, that's easy. You know, 1,700, 1,800. No, 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 no. They said, we can do one seven transactions per second. So we were like missing two zeros. It's like, oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> nope. Um, so as a DBA, you ask for the, the workload of the server. What, what does the server do? And you find out that when they do the test and they do 17 messages per second, you could calculate that 17 messages, how many calls? They did about 300 calls for every message. 
But the simplest message was to query a number or to update a number. Why do you need to do 300 calls to update one number? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> layers. Layers of Java. A application stack. They had the authentication system. They had a logging system. They had J, whatever. And so you end up discussing with them, you know, you, you, you cannot afford to do 300 calls if you need to do something in about 10 milliseconds. And they go, oh, but I don't know how to say this in English proper, but, oh, but, you know, that would not be the J2EE compliant, you know. And, yeah, but forget J2EE compliant. You are in a hurry. You cannot afford to do seven layers of code. You need to program this monolithically. A message comes in, it does what it needs to do, and it goes out. And that should be one call. Make sense? Yeah. yeah, well, to you it does. You're a DBA. <laughs> You're not a J2EE, whatever. The solution for them, of course, was to build a smart DB system and put the program inside the database. Totally counterintuitive for a Java person. But it, it made a lot of sense in this case. You know, and then you go down to something below 10 milliseconds. And by the way, they never hit that 1800 because customers are not that busy. But that was their benchmark. And it, it was doable. It was fixable. The amount of work and the amount of convincing the human part was the difficult part. Make sense? Everyone still awake? Okay. Ready for the... <laughs> um, the third anecdote. We had a commercial off-the-shelf system. And the queries take too long. So the customer has, our database has slowed down a lot because they loaded some real data. And the boss was like, you know, please just effing do it. Make this thing work. You're the database guy. This is a database problem. Do it. So yeah. Um, okay. How about an AWR? AWR for the non-Oracle. AWR is a diagnosed document from the Oracle database. It tells you what the database is doing. So I look at my AWR. What's, what's, what's wrong here? This tells me what is wrong most of the time. And I, the SQL was nine levels deep. And by that, I mean, you've got to select something from, and then in the from is a bracket, select something from, and then another bracket set, select something from. And what they had, some of the queries were totally unreadable and the explain plan was like a page and a half. Nine levels deep, a, gen a genetic data model, you know, a very intelligent uh, engineering system. It was meant for an engineering workplace as well. And what you had was software generated queries. Anyone does that? You, did you have applications that generate queries on the fly? Mind you, I am not against you doing that. I'm fine with it. I can do a whole presentation on how you should do that, avoid dynamic SQL, uh, use the using clause rather than dynamic, whatever, different presentation. It's not a bad thing to generate queries, but don't do it nine levels deep. That's too bad, okay? Um, so what I told them after less than a day, at the end of day one, I told them, just fucking don't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, but you know, we ask you literally to come in and just effing fix the thing, and then you tell us you can't fix it. I said, well, in diplomatic words, you're doing too much work for something that is online. Your users cannot af cannot afford to wait for this sort of query. You have to stop generating that query, or you have to unload your data. You know, because of course the problem was only there when the real data got in. Make sense? Right. So, yeah, difficult evening. Um, and the next day, uh, somehow it worked a lot better. And so, so we're, hang on, where are your queries? What have you done? And they said, well, it's commercial package. You know, we've unchecked some of the options. So they went into their configuration screen and they had unchecked a lot of the tick boxes and suddenly the queries came out quite reasonably. You know, so there you go, fixable. And the reason I could fix it, because I could look into that data, I could see inside the database. I've never seen, I've never looked inside their code, and I don't even know what it was. My suspicion is .NET, but it ran on Windows. But, um, you know, the, the fix was, have a good look at your database, and then tell them to not do it, and, and lo and behold, they didn't do it anymore. 
<laughs> I, I, I can still laugh at this the next morning. It's like, this is not the same system anymore. So no, no, we, no, we, we unchecked a couple of options. Okay, fine. So it was fixable because you could see and diagnose it from the database. I could not have fixed this by tracing Java or by uh, peeking into .NET with um, whatever trace tool they've got. You know, I, I couldn't have fixed it other than looking at the database. So database centric. That was case number three. Case number four is the really long one, the system from hell. Um, somebody had loaded data into a database that performs reasonably well. There's about 20 companies using the same software all over the world, all different. And in this case, somebody had loaded a lot of data, slow screens, slow reports, even slower M views. They already had M views in there. Um, Kiwi, kill it with iron. Move to Exadata. Beautiful. It was three times faster. It still meant that screens took about 20 seconds to open. Not acceptable to users. So yeah, users still suffered. Um, the, the users, by the way, were in Krakow in Poland. There might be actually people in the room. Uh, management. Um, we want a root cause analysis. So you, what you then do is you try to put a file in the ETC directory. You call that RCA in capitals, and you put LOL in there or something like that. Root cause analysis. Okay, that, That's the funny joke. Um, basically, you have to start by observing the system. AWR. And of course, it worked fine in dev. It's just that if you load too much data, somehow you, you tax the system. Uh, you investigate. You find out that you go to the AWRs, AWR reports, and the Oracle guys already know that, ah, uh, yeah, that one. No. CPU, totally on the CPU. Now, Exadata is really good at IO. It can do an awful lot of data movement in, in very few times, and it has facilities for extra fast IO and pre-caching and what have you. But if you do stuff on your CPU, if you're calculating factorials or stuff like that, there is no way you can go faster. You know, you will be about, and they were about three times faster than the VM they ran on before. And, and it was predicted by my team that you'll probably be about three times faster because we already knew it was a CPU bottleneck. It doesn't really help. It wasn't fast enough. Um, so you go down and you look at, yep, executes. 10,000, anybody know what the column is about still? Calls per second, yep. Uh, executes per second, actually. So it, it executes about 10,000 statements per second. And is this a chatty problem? Is this a chatty protocol? No, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Only 99 user calls. So I've got 99 calls coming in, and I do about 10,000 executes. So every one of those incoming user calls causes about 100 executes. It's definitely happening inside the database, this. Make sense? If, if this is too fast, if this is too much Oracle, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to it. No, so that, and that. there was a bit of a CPU bomb exploding. Um, so you zoom in and you try to find out what's happening. It seems to query mostly, see, uh, 3 million queries, 2 million queries, 1 million queries. And those queries return either one row, no rows, one row, no, one row, two thirds of a row, one row, one row, one row. <laughs> So what you have here is a million calls, and each of those calls returns one record. Uh, yeah, millions of calls, single records. And if you zoom in on the code, it is the class name from object, code from object, object from object, start from object, uh, one from object. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Now, why are you laughing? To this, to this was a serious problem for the users. And we know this is funny coding, but... It has grown that way for some reason. And remember, there are about 20 customers in the world that are reasonably happy using this system. So why does it not work for us? Um, let's have a look at it top to bottom. It was like a Russian doll. Uh, uh, it was a very rich application. It had views to define things. It was generated code, and it had instead of triggers. It was a very generic system. And by the way, it did translations. It could translate stuff to Polish, to, to French, to Spanish, and Portuguese, and what have you. A lot of the users were in South America. Um, the views of that system used functions. So in the view, a view has columns. Those columns were not table columns. They were function calls. So each of those columns 
resulted in a function call. And the functions were of the type like get something of a thing with a thing ID, you know, get the name of an object. And then the next function would be get the start date of the object. So functions on objects, an object was a view of about 136 tables. Hmm, interesting system. Let me try and explain it in a graph. So what you have is a bunch of tables with a view. And then 2,000 other tables also with views on them. And the average table had three views on it. Ooh. Yeah. So tables, views. Above those views, stored procedures, packages in Oracle terms, stored code. This is where the functions are. And then those functions are used in views. So those views call functions. So there you've got views. The views also have triggers on them, more work. And then the users see screens that are reflected by those views that call the functions from the view from the table. What, what you need to remember of this is, this is a lot of work. And there are reports out there somewhere and someone had already built materialized views to speed up the reports. Of course, the M views were calling the other views, were calling the functions, were calling the view. Yeah. Yeah, you get the picture. So this was the system. And in code, it looks a bit like this. You get a view. In there is a column and a column, and each of those columns is a function, etc. And you have a where clause, and in the where clause, you would have functions. Very generic and potentially very powerful. You could translate, and you can, you can literally recalculate joules into British terminal units if you wanted that. And sometimes they did. BTU, anyone know what a BTU is still? An ancient, ancient unit somewhere. And of course, we had some instead of triggers to make sure that updates could pass through and make the system even more powerful, flexible, and do more work. And then function call, function call, function call. You end up with a system that has red function calls everywhere. And the poor CPU is just running. So here's the quiz, wake up your neighbor. Was this a smart DB system or not? Bryn, what do you think? Well, you set up to say yes. Yeah. Okay, I, I agree. You could argue that this is a smart DB. Anyone else have an opinion on that? Uh, maybe, maybe. It, it, this, was, it, this is a marvelously powerful system because if you want that, you can have your screen reflecting British terminal units where the guys in South America look at the same data and they see kilojoules. That's powerful. Yeah. But it's a lot of work. Okay, so is what, what do you guys, who thinks this is a smart DB system? Hand. Yep, agree. Who thinks this is a maybe not smart DB system? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge on this one. And on the bottom, which is fallen off the screen, it says, my opinion, this is a smart DB system because the work is happening in the database. And, you know, having all the code in the database really helped because we could find it, we could fix it. We actually had three fixes for this system. And I have separate presentations on each of the fixes. But uh, you could just out-comment stuff that you don't use. Remove comment that you, don't, you think you don't use and suddenly the code becomes a lot faster. Ancient trick, comments. Uh, the second trick is to bypass the reports. Those reports call functions, but if you don't need British terminal units, you might as well query the table straight away and put that in a report. Make sense? I'll show you. Um, and I think SmartDB in this case saved my day because one, this system would never have survived all those years if it hadn't been a little bit smart. And I would not have been able to fix it if the code was in any other layer or any other place than in the database. So yeah, I, I was still happy with this system because it was at least in the database. And there's a number of reasons why I wasn't happy, but um, base, you start eliminating code here. This is where a lot of the, the CPU happened. You out comment stuff that you think you don't need and you hope the system survives. Fix number one. Uh, yeah, fix number one. Fix number two, bypass. This report 
Once you know what has to go in the report, you can rewrite the report and query the table and skip the view and skip the package and skip the view and just, just go there. Make sense? You have to join into the uh, the decode stuff at the same time. But, yeah. That was fix number. Fix number three is a totally different one, but we did some clever caching and function results. Um, so there you go. This old guy in the seat has got like discussions with the dot netter. Remember the dot netter and the slurp? Fixed. 1800 messages per second. Remember the layers of Java? Fixed. The ad hoc SQL and, and the database where we just told them, don't do this, sort of fixed. Okay. And then the, the Kiwi system with the clever application fixed in the database. These problems were fixable because they were in the database where we could get at them, where we could diagnose them and, and modify them. Make sense? Make sense. My conclusion would be smart database works. You know, for the, the rest of the theory about smart database, you have to listen to Bryn about layers in the database, about security, about PL SQL. My point is probably that if you take this smart DB concept, you can carry it to MySQL, you can carry it to Postgres, it works on most systems and it can be quite helpful. If you want your system to survive for many years, consider doing stuff on the database layer. Um, uh, this is my favorite quote. A database is smart. An application is a dumb and panicky animal, and you know it. Anyone recognize the movie? Yeah? You guys are old enough to know men in black? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, and then smart DB, like, it is more effort because you have to investigate time in learning what, what your database code is like. I am also in favor, I'm going to have this argument with Bryn maybe, I am in favor of publishing at least a data model. Maybe I wouldn't allow people to query my tables, but I want them to know what my database looks like. And I would like them to design the database in a proper relational model. You know, third normal form, think about key dependencies, think about your data. It is literally 80% of the work of a good application is to know your data. But that, that's my point. So I'm, I'm kind of against hiding everything in the database. But I agree that wild and, and unpredictable queries should not be allowed. So is it worth it? Hell yeah, it's worth it. If you can invest the effort, if you're strong enough. You know, you guys probably know the movie. Um, so yeah, the summary. I'm probably way too early, but that's good. You guys will have a lot of coffee if I'm finished. Uh, so smart code, put your code close to the data. Anyone know about the Hadoop theorem about putting code to data rather than data to code? You know, Hadoop proclaimed that about five years ago or so. There's a lot of truth in that. Data gravity, bring your stuff to the database and do the work there. Don't get your data out and, and put it in the wild and start processing it and, and spit it back again. You know, Don't do the slurping part. Code probably lives longer in the database because that database doesn't change much. If you start using Ruby on Rails and next year it's no longer in fashion, who's going to maintain your code? I can't. I don't even know how to read it. Um, it is easier to find and fix a problem in a database. If your work is done in 15 microservices all over the place in Dockers, there is no way I can diagnose that anymore, apart from maybe find a hotspot where a lot of work is going on. But I can't look at that code anymore. If it's in a database, I can look at it. I can diagnose it. I can probably fix it. Uh, code performs better in a database. There is a, a good presentation by a guy called Tone Coppolars on how stuff done in the database actually happens a lot faster than when you do it in an application layer. Uh, I, I could go into all the details, but it makes a lot of sense to process your stuff in the database. And by the way, do you remember those queries with the single row per query? A million calls with one row each? Try to avoid that. A database <coughs> is meant to do set processing. If you need to process 17 items, try to query them in one call. Make sense? You know, it's a set language. SQL is a set-based language. Try to use the sets. Makes sense, and I'm not shouting at my developers here, am I? Um, also, a database system is probably easier to secure than a system where the data goes all over the place. 
if you have 20 microservices doing work, you're not quite sure if you can protect all those microservices, but it is relatively easy and it is a known trick to secure a database. You might not be able to secure it from me, but you can secure it from most people. Uh, overall, do your stuff in the database. It is a lot more efficient and you probably don't need to buy as many instances from Amazon. You know, kill it with instances nowadays. Um, there are some challenges, like releasing a new version of your code into a database is challenging. You need something like EBR. Bryn can tell you all about it. The, the trick of maintaining multiple versions is you need to have really good API definitions, API descriptions, and you probably need pointers where you, that allow you to keep an old version and a new version of your code inside the database. You can use views, synonyms, EBR uses triggers, I think, but it, it, it's fairly complicated. You need to invest a bit of time in that, but it's probably easier to do that on a database level than it is to do that in 15 microservices. And I'm not, a, I'm not against microservices, but I'm skeptical. Um, and scale out, this is a difficult one. People will say, you cannot scale out if stuff is in a database. That's only partly true. If you really need a extreme scale out, we'll come to that in a moment. But a database in the year 2000 was busy just storing data, committing and logging data. A database nowadays is on hardware that can do so much more. Most databases stand there mostly being idle. You can use that processing power to actually do stuff. A good database call is in the order of 10 to 50 milliseconds. So you can easily do, even on a 4 or 8 CPU system, you could probably do a thousand calls per second on any database. Make sense? Do the math. Uh, scale out on a database is possible. You can buy instances at Amazon with 32 cores in them. You can run an awful lot of proce processing on that. If you really need more, so if you have like a million users from Australia clicking the whole night, then you need to start thinking about sharding. And then you end up possibly with sharded systems, possibly with something like Cockroach or what have you. But then you're in a totally different ballgame. Most databases that I see are somewhere under the terabyte size still and under the 500 to 1,000 users any time. You know, you can run that on a single machine nowadays. 20 years ago, that was a problem. My machine would be too busy. Nowadays, we can handle that. Make sense? Sleeping? Okay. No. Um, <laughs> something went wrong. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Database CPU, S CPUs are cheap, storage is cheap, and it's relatively fast nowadays. So I'm not too worried about scale out anymore. We can have this discussion over coffee or lunch, but I don't think scale out is a serious problem. If it is a problem for you, and your code is not efficient enough yet, then your messages are taking too much time, or you're processing too much data in one go. Remember the database? It is a strong, elegant, powerful thing. That is the image of your database. And it's also smart. Uh, smart DB. So, yep, hashtag. Um, don't drag your data around. Go to the database. Data gravity. Everything comes to the database. You should bring your code to the database. Uh, anyone want to tweet that hashtag? Okay. <laughs> So now you know about SmartDB, and imagine what you will know tomorrow. I, this is one of my favorite movies. If you're too young to know the movie, don't worry about it. Um, question time. Am I too early? Or? Okay. Okay, okay. Um, if there is time, I cannot possibly see. Uh, I can see. Anyone interested in... Anyone interested in a PL SQL course or something? Yeah. <laughs> no. 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 Was it? Okay, who, who, who goes like, this is pure nonsense, I do not buy this. And I, I, I can definitely understand if you say, I disagree, you know, because I- Excuse me? Like, two, two years ago, I would disagree, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not arguing against SmartDB. Yeah. I'm just uh, thinking like, uh, 
developers in other languages are used to like uh, some kind of comfort in, in uh, yeah. development tools, IDEs, and uh, correct external libraries available. Yeah. So I definitely see how like doing the same in PL SQL limits the set of tools available for them. True. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yes, that is true. Um, what you might end up with is a division of labor and people who focus on front ends and interesting user interfaces will stay in that area and and then they will have a contract, an API, if you like, with the backend developer who does the database work. That that is one way to go around it. And the, there is a cynical guy out there who says, yeah, I can have one good database programmer serving five user interface guys. But I, I tend to disagree with it. I would be in favor of your person looking into... It's 10 to 5. I would be in favor of your programmer looking into PL SQL. And remember, PL SQL resembles BASIC. Don't shoot me for that. PL SQL has a very simple structure. It processes sets, arrays. It has a for loop, a while loop, an until loop, and a couple of if statements. It, anyone can do that. Make sense? Yeah. Dot <laughs> .NET. Dot .NET. <laughs> dot .NET. <laughs> dot .NET. No. It, does that help? Does it somehow answer the question? No. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Uh, just remark remark about uh, those um, uh, statements where which were generated automatically and uh, yeah. inclusions, nine levels, or yeah. whatever. Uh, in Oracle, Oracle also generates such yeah, statements, <laughs> warehouse builder, data integrator, yeah. and there are much, much more levels. <laughs> Just remember. I can, it's, it's a correct remark. It is not a problem if you can afford the time to process it. And for uh, business intelligence tools, uh, response times of multi-seconds or even minutes is not a big problem. But if you have users waiting for data to come back to a screen, I cannot afford to do really heavy queries. This particular tool didn't have that problem in development or in testing. The problem only appeared when they loaded half the enterprise engineering stuff into the database. So generated SQL is not necessarily bad. But if it goes bad, you need to stop. Make sense? Is, is that the correct answer to the... Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> Anyone else? Any? Really? Ah. You guys, any, anyone here? Who, who here thinks that they've seen or built a smart DB system? One, two, uh, 30%. Let, let me rephrase the question. Who here recognized the problems like chatty, unmaintainable? You know? oh. See? Now, you, now you, you know how to tell, what to tell your boss, how to avoid those problems. Yeah. Correct? Careful. I, I'm not against microservices, but and you are. I will let you store stuff on queues or other persistent areas as much as you like. But the serious truth has to go into a database and has to go has to be modeled in a proper entity table relation diagram, so that you know what you're doing. Yeah. Correct. Correct. We we will have that discussion with a lot of microservices people. There is a, a large industrial site in Holland that is now going to microservices. And they don't really know where their data is anymore because each of those microservices has their own store. And if you lose one of those stores, you you lose part of your enterprise, if you like. It, it's kind of risky. Yeah. yeah. Bang. Actually. Um, it was this, um, I, w I would be interested in the people in the room who went like, this was totally incomprehensible to me, you know? And then tell me what I need to improve to, to make this communication more clear and to put this idea better in front of everyone. And if I cannot explain it simple enough, you know. Hey. 
I'm uh, I'm really done. Uh, so yeah. it's me again. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, today, software also has to integrate with uh, external systems, and probably call like yeah. something elsewhere. And uh, would you suggest to do that integration in the like user interface layer or still in the database? Yeah. Um, integration with other systems probably has to happen on a call level or on an API level. So I, I would be careful to to diagnose to and to define the edges of your system. Yeah. What do you send to another system and what message would you expect yeah. back? And so no. now the, my point is if you have some logic uh, like outside the database, how do you Sp uh, split it uh, between the database and uh, between like some integration yeah. and how do you uh, avoid the problem of calling database too often? Um, if, if the problem is diagnosed as too many calls to the database, you'd have to choose whether you do the processing totally outside or more of it inside the database. It, it, it's difficult for me to, to answer that question in a straight yes or no, because my instinct would be to do more work inside the database, but there can be good arguments for to do something in an application layer, possibly use an, some temporary persistence somewhere. Maybe you have a queuing system that you want to use. So I, I don't really have a good answer to that question. But in case of doubt and in case of diagnose or problems, I would consider doing more stuff in a database. Yeah, But that's because my background. Makes sense? Is, is it a good answer to that? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to tell, this, this is a perfect conference, and I am not criticizing the conference because it's really well done. But the light is a bit, <laughs> okay? Guys, I'm done. As far as I'm concerned, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, if we are talking about smart DB, uh, what do you mean? Is it uh, only relation? The relational database, or we are talking about uh, NoSQL database as well. Yeah. Yeah. In in my part, my story is about what you call a relational database. It is when your data has to be somewhere secure and safe, as asset, if you like, atomic, consistent, isolated, and dependable. If you are looking at uh, at, at something big database or something NoSQLy. You have to ask the question, do you need to be asset? If you have to be asset, you need a commit mechanism. And I would recommend you do your work as close to the data as needed or as possible. <laughs> if you can afford eventual consistency in the cap theorem, you can probably do your work anywhere. But then keep in mind that uh, systems like Hadoop actually generate code and send that to their data stores to execute it on the data store rather than in a different layer. So all of those things actually bring code to the database anyway. In this case, uh, how we should work with a um, huge amount of data? So it's uh, if you have um, billions of uh, users and uh, yep. Yep. Uh, terabytes of inter yep. data. Yes, yes. Um, if, if you reach the limits of hardware or, or processing, you need to consider sharding. Sharding is a, is a difficult topic. You need to find a sharding key, a hashing mechanism, decide how many shards you're going to use, decide how you do resharding or redistribution. Uh, it's probably a topic for a different uh, presentation. If you have a system that is so big that it literally cannot run on a single data system, uh, we need to think. And, and by the way, sharding is not new. British Telecom did sharding stuff in the late 90s. And they, they ran into a, a lot of problems and they learned a lot of lessons from that already. You, you can find those things coming back in uh, Greenplum and Cockroach and Oracle is having a sharding offering now as well. Yeah. But then th that's a different dimension from the systems that I normally work with. Yeah. Make sense? Welcome. Next. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs>